Hi everyone and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Rachel Pather and I'm a Senior Advisor to Skybridge Capital based here in Abu Dhabi, as well as being the MC for SALT, a thought leadership forum and networking platform that encompasses business, technology and politics. Now, as many of you know, SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with some of the world's foremost investors, creators and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do here is provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts. Today's focus is going to be on family businesses, entrepreneurship, and gender diversity. And who better to discuss these topics with than Michelle Kinney, one of the most iconic business figures in the Middle East. Michelle is chairman of the Canoe Group, one of the lo longest uh, running, largest, and independent family owned businesses in the Gulf region. He is also a motivational speaker, is published in business journals on a regular basis, and holds chief positions as chairman or director of various companies, including AXA Insurance Gulf, Gulf Capital, KHK and Partners Limited, Delma Capital, Johnson Arabia, and CAF Investments. Finally, Michelle is also something of a role model to me for the absolute tireless work that he does in terms of female empowerment and gender diversity in the region. So Michelle, welcome to Salt Talks. It's a real pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we have quite a geographically diverse audience on today's calls and I know what they say about assumptions, but assuming that people don't have much knowledge about you or your background, could you just tell me a bit about your personal story? Well, um, uh... Okay, I, I, it's it's kind of a, uh, an embarrassing situation to be put in because it's unusual for me to sit and talk about myself. However, I will say the things that I am very proud of are the fact that I am uh, married and have four beautiful children and they mean the world to me. And uh, that is my main concern in life. Uh, other than, of course, ensuring that uh, whatever businesses I'm in does as the best that it can do and make sure that the people who work within the organization also uh, get as best uh, an opportunity for them to grow and to benefit from, uh, from the organizations we're in. Um, I think it's very important that um, we, for, we, because we tend to forget as humans, um, when we put organizations at uh, the top of the list, when reality is always gonna be the humans who have to be at the top of the list and recognizing them and recognizing the people who help build any uh, business um, or any uh, such, um, institution, they are the key personnel. They are the people who you should be say, saying thank you to all the time. And we seem to forget that. And uh, I'm, I would never be in the place I am without the fact that I am a member of, of my family. Um, I am a member of my company. I'm a member of my community. I'm a member of my society. And each of them play an important role in where I have uh, uh, arrived. And I think it's, it's also very important to recognize that uh, education is what got me to sit here with yourself and be able to sit and talk to you. Uh, education is formal education and uh, education is informal education and it's both of them and being able to utilize both of those, again, is the reason why I'm sitting here and able to be able to talk to you about the situation or, or any other uh, or, any situa or any thought that you'd like to express and talk to me about. Fabulous, and I'd love to come back a bit later to the points you made about education, but you do work for one of, you know, the oldest, largest, and most well-respected family businesses in the region. Did you always want to work in the family business? Uh, the reality is yes and no. Uh, uh, yes, I, I always wanted to give back to my family because they've been very generous with me. They, uh, when, you, when somebody takes care of you, somebody ensures that you have an opportunity, I think the very least you can do is give back something to them. Uh, and no, because uh, after a while, it becomes uh, um, a bit uh, hard to continue pursuing all the, all the goals you want to do uh, from a personal point of view. Uh, it, it's not that I have anything against my family. In fact, I love my family. And I think what you call, as I said, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for my family and all the support I get from my family. It, it's what makes uh, family businesses special. Um, not just my family, but families in general. And um, it's, 
having the heritage, I mean, the, the company started in 1890 in Bahrain. So having that heritage in this region is not easy to come by. Uh, having a huge network, which we were made up of family members uh, at one time, or which were made up of uncles. For, for me, they were made up of uncles and now made up of cousins. Uh, and each one brings his, his or her own um, uh, speciality, knowledge base. And we all play a whole role together to make this company significant. And being part of that for me is really special. So uh, while I won't, I'm not able to do everything I want to do as a, from a personal point of view, but having this as uh, 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 something to fall back on and something to be full of pride about, and not, not arrogance, but pride in my family and what we've accomplished uh, keeps me and drives me forward. And so if you go back, you know, 1890, the family business was established 130 years ago. You've been through a number of, sort of generational uh, wealth transfers during that time. How well prepared do you think family businesses are in general in the Gulf region for intergenerational wealth transfer? And maybe in terms of being institutionalized enough to make that transfer without too much the political tension. You ask a very, very important question because a lot of family businesses, not just in the Gulf, but in the world as a whole, it, there is a, an axiom that usually says uh, the ground, and sorry, it's going to be male dominated in terms of uh, the, the wording, but it, it's uh, the, the grandfather starts the business, the son uh, uh, takes care of the business, and the grandson fitters it away. Um, you Again, it doesn't matter which country you're from, there's always an axiom that's similar to that one. And it's usually by hitting the third generation. And the reason why hitting the third generation, the business starts to die uh, is because there is a loss of connection between the, 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 last, the, the last generation, the third one, and the first generation in terms of the struggle and, uh, and the pain that went into making it. Uh, and uh, there is a dis because of that disconnect, they can't see why they have to continue the, the, the struggle. Um, I think we were lucky in that every generation in, within my family, every generation looked upon the new one as a rebirth of a new business. And uh, we take a new generation and we look at it and say, okay, this is what we have currently, but now the next generation has to add on to it and, and build up on it. It's, 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 a new, it's a new generation and a new idea, a new thought. It, it, it's not a disconnect because we are consistently and constantly talking to one another, interacting with one another. We see, uh, I mean, I got to see the, the pains of my uncles um, uh, who um, helped institutionalize, for us, institutionalize this business in the 1960s, uh, which at that time was a, a very strange, what you call it, uh, it was a very strange beast. Um, usually it was the, um, uh, the father running the business and bringing his son, uh, son, son or sons on board and then they would run everything. Uh, whatever the father said, the sons would apply. Um, my uncles, uh, two of them at the time, my uncle Ahmed and my uncle Muhammad, uh, God rest their souls, uh, decided we are going to institutionalize this. Um, they, they, they saw the British uh, um, equivalent that they were competing against and they brought in professional managers and the professional managers had a very strong say in terms of how the business was run in conjunction with by setting up a board, by setting up um, uh, how a business should be functioning, uh, governance structures. We, we did that in the 60s. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why we managed to institutionalize such a, at such an early time. And I love what you said about your sort of constantly not reinventing yourself. That's maybe the wrong word, but trying to be innovative within the family business. Where are you looking at in this generation and how have you changed your investment strategy and focus to make sure you stay current? Well, um, what's happening currently in the world is, is a complete different ball game compared to what happened before. So in the past, uh, you had geographical slash political barriers that would block uh, companies to come into your playground and start competing with you. Right now, uh, it doesn't really matter what business you're in. If it is expandable, if it's scalable, it'll be coming to your neighborhood, whether you like it or not. Um, and you have to start to say, okay, I have what I have, and it will take a while for this current business to be threatened. 
but there is, but there are opportunities on the other side, and the new businesses are coming up. Which one of them is going to be um, a unicorn? For you, I'm using the, the the moniker that's used currently for uh, large uh, companies. And since it's a shot in the dark, really, because you don't know which one is going, to, which one is going to be, um, the, the the key is trying to understand: Do you want to stay in your current businesses and hope to God it goes away, which I can't see happening? Do you want to stay in your businesses and look completely outside of the uh, your area of comfort? Or are you going to look at your businesses and say, okay, what businesses can I add to that are going to scale up and I can be part of that huge scale up that's going to happen? Um, right now, every company is basically, uh, at least family businesses anyway, are trying to figure out which one is the best approach. I think those who are going to say, you know, I'm going to see myself up in a cocoon and everything is going to go back to what it was before, they will very soon cease to exist. Of the other two, uh, one is a more um, uh, pot shot, hoping it actually happens. And the other one is a bit more focused. Now, it might be that it will take a while for the ones that they're, they're concentrated on, uh, concentrating on, the investments they're concentrating on, will bear fruit. Um, the question is, to what degree are you willing to be patient? Um, if, if you are an, an early investor, for, for example, if you are an early investor in Amazon, and first five years, horrible. Um, next five years might not have been that great. But 20 years on, wow, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's, this is the company you want to be part of. But how many people had the breath to wait for that to happen? Because it might be that it's not the business that's strong. It's not the management that's strong. It's just an issue of time because you need things to catch up with you. Um, or in some cases, for example, uh, uh, things that happen overnight. I mean, you have so many companies that started in say, 2018, and today are, are bigger than uh, companies that existed 100 years ago. It's, it's a matter of sometimes luck. Uh, and, and, and I know we, we, like, we try to think in business uh, or investment, there's no such thing as luck. Oh, yes, there is. Um, and sometimes it's an educated guess and Perseverance, because again, out of, uh, when, whenever someone invests in a private equity or invests in a VC fund, the, 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 the rule is uh, one or two are, wow, spectacular, three are okay, and the rest are garbage. The question is, in any business, if you're going to take that approach, uh, you must be able to hope that of your uh, bouquet of, of investments that you've invested in, one or two of them are actually going to be successful and you stay with it. Now, uh, how lucky are you? Well, that depends on how lucky are you. Yeah, no, and I think you're almost de-risking yourself as well, Ali, if you're investing in companies that can have a direct impact on existing companies in your portfolio. You obviously have a very diverse portfolio. I do want to go down further into some investment questions. But Before you get to this, I, I also want to focus on one thing. Um, the current businesses, that any business uh, currently in, uh, does, is not going to go away for uh, these new technologies. Uh, the people forget that technologies, uh, any technology is a tool that will be utilized by a business. And this is key. Um, I'm not going to invest in technology for the sake of technology. I'm going to invest in technology that's going to actually help what I currently have. So the key is to be able to understand where I am and what technologies are out there that I can add on to my business because that business is not going away. For example, food is not going to go away. Logistics is not going to go away. Shipping is not going to go away. Air travel is not going to go away. But the tools that will get me from point A to point B or the product from point A to point B or the service from point A to point B those, if I can get those tools that make me more um, uh, better positioned than my competitor, is what will drive business towards me. So I just wanted to mention this point. Uh, old, the old world businesses should not be thrown aside and thinking that they're, they're dead. They're not dead. It's just how many, how many new tools do I have? Can I add on to my current business to allow me to grow that? That will be uh, key to my success if I picked the right tool for it. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to clarify. I just wanted to clarify that point. No, I think that's a great clarification point, like using technology more as 
an enabler rather than a separate asset class, as it were, in and of itself. Uh, we've already had actually a couple of audience questions come in that are related to the, the specifically the family business side of things. So I'll address them now. We've had a question from Ken, thank you as always, Ken, who said, Michelle is so impressive and his, and his family's accomplishments. Please ask what he and his family are doing to prepare the next generation to take forward business. And maybe uh, this comes back to the education point that you raised before as well. Th th this is, uh, educa uh, formal education is very important. This, uh, there is no doubt. And by the way, this is something that we, we, we've always done, at least as far as I can remember. Um, you, get a, you have to get a formal education because that's the basis of where you start the other education. But once you have the formal education, then the other education, which is the on the, on the ground, hands-on education. I'll give you an example of what, something I experienced. When I got my, my bachelor's degree, I was really happy. You know, I'm, I'm, I have my degree. Uh, right, now I want to have a position in the company. I want to run things and do things and fix things. And, and my father looked at me like, what are you talking about? Yes, you have a formal education, but you don't know anything about the businesses we're in. So do a, a round of the businesses. So I did a round of the businesses. Now, and then I thought, oh, you know what? Now I have a better grasp of the businesses. I know everything and I can take on the world. And my father says, you know what? No, you're going to experience what everyone else experiences um, from the bottom up. And while it's annoying and it was painful, it did give me insights that otherwise I wouldn't have. So yes, it's important to get the formal education. Yes, it's important to get the, uh, the training, uh, whether it's going investment banking training, which a lot of investment banking uh, will go to family business, investment bank, banks, sorry, will go to, to family businesses and say, uh, give, uh, give us your, your, um, your children to help train them in the investment aspect of it. But it's only when you're in there on the ground, when you feel that you don't have a, uh, uh, a say in things, and you can start seeing things without having to worry about things uh, so much because you are so low in the food chain that you can get to have a better picture. Uh, one of the things we do do in our family is we send our, as soon as uh, someone is, uh, graduates and has been uh, uh, gone through a small uh, um, uh, series of understanding our current businesses, we try to send them outside to other businesses to go and work outside. And the idea is you go work outside, you don't have your family name to carry you and to push you forward. Uh, you get to see what other people, uh, uh, how they interact. You, you get a better understanding of human nature. Um, and then when you come back in, you are a bit more of a rounded person. And then you add your experience. There is nothing I, I can, um, there's nothing better than for a person to have than his or her own experience in uh, a business um, because that adds a dimension that books cannot explain to you. Other people who've experienced it cannot experience, explain it to you because it's a, something you've touched, you felt, you've experienced. And then you can have a better picture. Now, hopefully, the, the, um, the, the member of the family who comes in uh, doesn't come in with an idea that, um, sorry, uh, once they've gone, they've gone through all that, those steps, doesn't come in with the idea that, uh, okay, now I know everything because we're constantly in uh, uh, flux and change and we have to understand how things work. And, um, uh, another anecdote, I had, I had in my office, I had a huge uh, pic, uh, painting and it says the word in Arabic, kella. Uh, kella is not la. In Arabic, la means no. Kella is a definitive no. It means forget it, it's never gonna happen. And everyone used to ask me, why do you have the painting behind you? Uh, why do you have that painting in your office? And I said, because this is the first thing my family tells me every time I have an idea. No. <laughs> and one day I, I got frustrated. And I've been in the company for a while. And I got frustrated. And I went to my uncle, uh, my uncle Abdullah, uh, who was the chairman at the time. And I asked him, why do you say no? Why is it every time I have an idea? You say no. He said, because I want you to go and find every plausible answer for every plausible refusal I'm going to give you so when I say no, you can give me the answer and finally I'll be convinced and we can move forward. And I said, you know what? I didn't think of that. Uh, and it's only again, coming through these experiences. Now, um, hopefully uh, I, I think myself and my cousins don't do that to our younger cousins, uh, younger siblings. Um, the idea is 
to try to help them, uh, uh, embolden them to take risk, to, to um, uh, don't worry. If you make a mistake, you learn from your mistake. The key is to learn from your mistake um, and get, an get a formal education. This is key. Get a, um, a working ed uh, education uh, experience. Uh, learn, read, come back, go outside, learn from others, come back, and then try and, and take risks. And if you fail, we are there to, as, as your, um, we are like a coach. Uh, we're there to hold your hand. You have a problem, go and try to fi uh, find the, the solution yourself. You can't find it, come back to us and we'll try to help you. Our job is always to find ways to help people move forward. The next one, and this is key, well, a lot of families need to understand this, uh, is I need to prepare the next generation for succession. I cannot take their time. I, I have a certain amount of time where I will work and then I need to find myself slowly taking a, a back step and allowing other members to come in and for me to sit back and end up being like a, a consultant. They then they take up the decision making, they take up the, 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 the uh, reins of the company, and I'm there to consult if you have a problem, if you've never experienced this, if you have a political um, tangling that needs untangled, that's what my job should be. You know, you mentioned the power of the word no and sort of forcing you to look at other possibilities and options. But one thing that I do find, and you know, this is perhaps a cultural thing or a society at large, is there are a lot of yes men out there, right? So there's a lot of people that will just say yes, even if they don't think that it's a good approach. I know you sit on a lot of boards. Uh, what do you think about sort of the notion that you just surround yourself with yes men and it makes your, your path a bit easier and how do you go about changing that culturally and create an environment where people do actually speak up and say no? If you want a company to fail with you, surround yourself with yes men. Because the moment you die, the company collapses. It's simple as that. I don't need, uh, no company needs chaos from within as in people fighting all the time. But you need people to push back. If you have an idea, there, okay, I hire professional people. So if I don't listen to the professional advice, why do I hire them? I can do this all by myself. I really don't need them. I need people to come back and say, you know what? Don't give me an opinion. Uh, I, I have as many people who, uh, and every person has an opinion. I don't need opinions. I need you to, to defend what you say with something that is uh, on the ground. You, you have better knowledge in finance, explain to me why this investment's not good. You have better knowledge in operation, explain to me why we shouldn't be doing this logistic. You have better knowledge in uh, human resources, explain to me why I shouldn't hire this person. This is what I what is res the responsibility of any leader. Uh, the, the, there is this misunderstanding that leaders are uh, the, the person on top of the hill, leading the charge, um, and everyone is a minion following behind. I assure you, the moment that the, that person is killed, the minions will run away. Now, that's one alternative. The more su uh, sustainable business uh, style, with, uh, sorry, with a leadership style, should be I bring in people who can help grow the company. So, whether I am there or somebody else comes in, it shouldn't have an effect necessarily on the business itself. And, in, uh, and the best example I can give you, this is, this is a story I learned um, when I was in university and it stuck in my head. Uh, and forgive me for just a couple of minutes, uh, just to understand the type of leadership you should have. Uh, the story goes, there was this young, uh, young boy in China walking with his father and they saw a gathering of uh, men, one man who was sitting down and a lot of men surrounding him. And uh, the young boy asks the, uh, the father, who's that? And the, the, uh, the father says, that's the emperor of China. Oh, so the boy goes, oh, he must be the bravest man in China. So the father goes, no, no, it's that man over there. Oh, in that case, he must be the smartest man in China. He goes, no, that's that man over there. Uh, he must be the wisest. And imagine all the adjectives, what you call it, the bravest, the smartest, the most philosophical, the best swordsman, the best. 
no, 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 it's that man, it's that man, it's that man. So the son is looking at the father and goes, well, if he's not any of these attributes, why is he the emperor of China? And the father says, because he's the hub that allows all these spokes to function. And this is the key of leadership. If you, you don't need to be the best, but you need to surround yourself with the best and you need to allow them enough space to be able to push this company forward. Because remember, it's in their interest as much as yours. If you're the leader, it's in their interest as much as yours to move this thing forward, whatever the, the company is. They need to be part and parcel of it. If they feel at any point it's not theirs, they have no, uh, they've not bought into it, or very soon they will either go away or utilize you as a base for their own benefit. Yeah, I really like that hub and spoke analogy. I think that's very applicable. And, you know, we spoke, I think it was last month, about gender balance boards. And I want to talk about this specifically in relation to speaking one's mind as well and, you know, creating an environment where people can say yes. Where are the weaknesses in regional family businesses and maybe even society at large and creating a sort of environment where females feel, you know, in a safe place where they can they can be assertive rather than being called something else? Um, I, I will say fortunately, uh, in family business as a whole, uh, better than say non-family businesses, uh, unless we talk multinational companies, but in family businesses as a whole, I think there's uh, an, a, depending also on the age uh, of the makeup of the, uh, the family business itself. Um, there's a lot more females coming in and playing an active role in, in the businesses. And it's hopefully smart families are not using them as a rubber stamp to say, look, we, we have uh, females in our, in our company. They are, uh, women are as smart as men. There's, there's no reason to think when you call it otherwise. Um, they have a, they have a different perspective in terms of how things are done. Um, there have there are certain traits that females bring that males don't bring. Now, I'm, by the way, I'm talking about traits. I'm not talking whether the, I'm not talking about the gender, but some of the female traits that are, uh, that are brought in, and the more the the are the better for a company. Uh, consensus building, uh, care for people around you, making sure that that there is a buy-in. These are very female female oriented traits. Um, Male-oriented traits are decision-making, quick, quick decision-making, um, um, uh, attacking the hill type of mentality. You know, I, I'm going to gather people and attack the hill. That's a very male uh, trait. I don't necessarily want to see a female on a board that just thinks like a, uh, a, a, have all these female traits. And I don't want to see males having just male traits. I want to see that after a while, the, both the males and females on the board, there's a cross filter between the female traits and the male traits so that both of them can start understanding each, each other because the more you have a, a better understanding, because there are times when you need to make quick decisions and there are times when you need to uh, be consensus building. And having those traits, whether it's male or female, between both genders on a board is always going to be something beneficial for any board. Um, Lip service is never going to achieve anything. Uh, having also, um, uh, by the way, one, in terms of family businesses, just, just to bring this to the issue of family businesses, you'll find the most successful family businesses are not how, the ones that are run on board level. It's the one with a very strong matriarchal uh, person who ensures in the background that there is consensus building, that there is some sort of uh, camaraderie between everyone. And she is looked upon as the person that they all fall back to. Because yes, I need to make quick decisions in, in a business perhaps, but I also need to have harmony within a family. And she can help in that aspect, no way, in a way much better than a male can. Uh, uh, males, unfortunately, uh, will focus on the fear factor the dictatorship mentality, but, but the, the females, uh, the, uh, the patriarch, but the matriarch is much more of a consensus building and making sure that no one's left, left, left out. Everyone gets a piece of the pie. Uh, not everyone necessarily gets equal pieces of the pie, but at least they get a piece of the pie and there's a buy-in. And this is important and it's not seen 
uh, superficially, it's not seen. And it doesn't have to be seen. But if there is no matriarchal counterbalance to the patriarch, you have uh, issues going to happen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's a great point you made about the box ticking. I mean, I don't think putting someone in a position just to tick a diversity box is going to be beneficial to anyone. Is there anything you can do and maybe a politically correct answer that we could do to address the sort of fake advocates of diversity? So those people that are just doing it to pay lip service, is there a, a way around that? Well, um, I'm hoping the Darwin uh, mentality, uh, sorry, the Darwin Awards mentality kicks in, i.e. those who don't utilize something to the better, better, betterment and sustainability of their organization eventually kill themselves off. Uh, you, don't, you, you, you can't change their mindset. If someone has a mindset that he or she thinks, sorry, in this case, he thinks that he's right and he knows everything and he's, not, he's going to do everything that, the way he wants, eventually he's going to kill his company and, and so much the better. Um, sad for the people employed by him, but so much the better because when that company dies, another company comes up in its place and hopefully are smart and intelligent to say, oh, let's see it from the mistake that, that that company did and let's change that. And again, bringing people on board. Um, to my knowledge, um, men did not inherit the genius gene. It's available to both genders. Men did not inherit the uh, knowledge gene. It's available to both genders. Perspective, a uh, male's perspective and a female perspective are different. An intelligent person will say, you know what? I need to have, since women make up at least, if not more than half the, the population, if I'm selling something to them, I need to make sure I understand what they like. And so I need to bring them on board and make sure that they also tell me what I like. If you're going to invest in uh, FMCG, sorry, in, in uh, retail, in clothes, the, the best thing you could do, uh, and I heard this from uh, the founder of, uh, I believe it was Vanguard Fund. Uh, he's a famous, uh, famous gentleman, I can't remember his name, but I remember what he said. He took his advice from his teenager, teenage girls telling him, these are the companies they like. These are the companies her and her friends buy from. And then you start thinking, you know what? If I asked my boys, they would never know this. If I never, if I never asked my girls, I'd never know this. So he was intelligent enough to say, you know what? I'm going to try to find from every resource, including my wife, my children, my, my girls, my boys, my friends. I'm going to try every resource I can to bring to to help me in their own way direct me to my benefit now as i said if i don't have the the female perspective whether it's uh, on the board whether it's in the employment in the company whether it's within my family if i don't have that perspective i've lost half the market why would i do that why would an intelligent person do that uh, the, the first thing i'd be doing is trying to find from everyone what everyone wants and then see whether I can afford them uh, to uh, bring them the product and or service or not. That's what intelligent people do. Not intelligent people, as I said, hopefully will go down the Darwin Awards way where they kill themselves off as they die. That was more politically correct than I thought you would give. So thank you for that. And we've had a few people come in and say, yes, that was John Bogle from Vanguard uh, that, made, that made that comment. We've had more, so many question, uh, audience questions coming in. Someone has asked, what do you suggest for children who are rebels and not willing to flow with the family? And I guess that means from a, a cultural perspective. I, I know the feeling because I'm, I'm one of them. Um, the, the, um, there are different types of rebels. Um, those who re re uh, rebel against authority and those who are rebelling against a person. Not necessarily the authority, but the, the, the person wielding an authority against them. So um, if that person that's wielding the authority against them goes away, that rebellion, rebellious nature goes away. It is just, just natural. And that those, those who rebel against an, an, an idea, you can't do anything about that. Um, 
one way to harness this, if you do have a, a, a quote unquote black sheep, or, or I don't know if that's politically correct, I can use these words these days, um, or a rebellious person, maybe it's time for that person to discover for him or herself what he or she can do. So I would say, here's a chunk of money, whatever the amount of money is, here's a chunk of money, go away. Uh, now, uh, go away and discover for yourself, and then you'll understand what you're missing. Or here's a chunk of money, but you need to also put a chunk of money in there so that you have skin in the game, so it hurts you. And let's see how well you do. And if you do really, really well, put in a clause that says the, the parent company can come and buy the, the company that you've built if you, if you both agree to it. This way, there's an incentive. If I don't like the way you're running things, and I think I can do better, here's a, here's a bunch of money. You add a bunch of money to it. Go run the business. Go run the business that you think you can run. You will either fly because your, your idea is fantastic and great, or you'll be mediocre, and then you might want to think about going back or not, or you'll fail, and then you can come groveling back to the family. It, it's the three options are there. But I think sometimes... Uh, again, depending on age, because if you have someone who's rebelling at 40, there's a systematic issue that you need to address. You have someone rebelling at 20, it's usually a personality issue, and, and you can control that one. Um, you can try to help them along, uh, along the way. When you have someone rebelling at 40 or even 50, uh, you can have that. You need, again, it might be a systematic thing that you need to address. Why is this person rebelling? Sometimes it's not that they rebel just for the sake of rebelling. There is something that they're telling you that you're not listening. Now, I, I, it's it always takes two to tango. Uh, forget the, uh, forget, forgive me on the cliche, but it, it, it's two parties. One is trying to tell you there's an issue, and the other party is saying there is no issue. Now, if you don't want to listen to the other one, ideally, pay them off and let them go away. If you keep them inside, it's like having an angry tiger in your house. Do you really want to have an angry tiger? But that's what you're asking for. Yeah, and this may be a Mike Tyson or someone, but um, no, I really like that point about- I mean, Angry tiger, it's, oh, in okay, any, angry tiger, how about that? In any situation, I guess, you know, no one party has ever solely solely guilty uh, we've had a number of audience questions coming in as well interested about your approach and you mentioned sort of supporting the family at a micro level do you also look at with your businesses really supporting i guess the regional ecosystem so is it important for you to invest in in regional startups and companies and how do you sort of see your role within the middle east um I will talk from my personal point of view rather than my family because it's, it's easier for me to do that. From my personal perspective, um, there are two roles. When I invest, there are two things that are in my, my head. Obviously, the first one, which is what everyone is in, but no one wants to say, is in, I'm in there for the money. I say that to get that out of the way because if I don't make money, then I can't continue doing the things I want to do. It's, it's not... Uh, uh, will my lifestyle change? Not really. But I want to take that money so that I can do the things that I really actually want to do. This is where it comes to the second point. Uh, I'm 51 years old. I'm not going to create uh, rocket science, what you call it. But there are people in the region in their 20s, in 30s, perhaps even in their 40s, who have the breath to want to do that. And sometimes there's no one who believes in them. That's when you have to sit, okay, I don't necessarily have to invest financially, but I can invest with my ear. I can invest with my experience. I can invest with talking to them and giving them an opportunity. You know what? If you do something along those lines, I'm interested at the next stage. So I'm giving you hope. Get to that next stage. I will come in, but get to that next stage. Um, if you need help in terms of how do I address this problem? Maybe you need somebody who can help you because they've experienced that. And that's what I'm here for. My job is to try to help the young generation. And in respect for me, I, I, um, nationality becomes secondary. 
The key for me is to help young men and young women who want to do something, who don't want to be lazy, who don't want to rely on others, who want to create something, who want to add something to this world, and sometimes might not have the opportunity. My job is to help them get there. As I said, different stages takes, uh, uh, some, sometimes it's just a pat in the back, sometimes it's just recognition, sometimes it's experience and knowledge, it's sometimes opening a door, sometimes it's finance. But my job, and this is for me key, I want to make sure as much as I can, and I am limited to what I can do, but as much as I can to help those people to get to a point where they can pick up themselves. The more we have those success stories, at least, and I'm talking in this region, irrespective of the nationality, but the more we have in this region, the more all the rest of the world will start saying, you know what, something's happening here. And it is, we have young, intelligent, bright, smart, articulate um, go-getters, uh, risk takers, they're in Egypt, they're in North Africa, they're in the Levant, they're in Iraq, they're in the Gulf. They, sometimes they feel, I don't have the ability, uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the, the support, not the ability, I don't have the support around me. And, and my job, and I hope others will also do the same thing, and saying, you know what? No, no, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you promote and do whatever you want to do because we want this region to be a, a bastion of opportunities for, uh, for others. And I'm taking my lesson and, uh, and I'm not saying this because somebody puts, is putting a gun to my head. I'm saying this because I actually believe this. I'm taking a, a lesson from uh, the, uh, sorry, a, a page from the lesson that Dubai created and sp very specifically Dubai because Dubai said, I'm going to open up the door. I'm going to open up the, the, the landscape and I'm going to give you the opportunity as long as you don't cause uh, mischief in, in, in the place to grow your businesses. How many businesses in the Arab world have grown starting from here because the door has been open? And I would love to see this happen in Saudi Arabia. I'd love to see this happen in uh, Bahrain, in Oman, in uh, Kuwait, in Qatar, in Yemen in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Palestine, uh, um, um, Morocco, uh, Algeria, Tunis, Sudan, Egypt, did I miss anyone? Somalia, I'm trying to think of the, the ones in the Arab world. Did I miss anyone? Djibouti, I think I, Djibouti was the last one. We're going to get people writing in from uh, a country that you've left off of this time. They're going to be very irate. Uh, but no, I think that's great. And you know, you're obviously doing so much to support the, the ecosystem and the family and businesses in the region. We do just have time for one more question. So I'd be very interested. You you put so much effort into helping others achieve their goals and acting as a source of inspiration. Who or what inspires you? Uh, the answer for me is very simple, but I, I, I'm a bit of... Um cautious in what I'm about to say because I don't want it, I don't want it to sound from a, uh, I'm propagating religion. But the rea for me, the reality is, um, it's for me, the, the book that, I, that matters to me the most is the Quran. And the personality that matters to me the most is the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. And the reason I say that is because the gist of the Quran, put the religious aspect aside, the gist of it is, to be fair and to be caring. And this is what any business has to be to its employees, to its customers, to itself, to be fair, just, and to be caring. Because there are some times when you need to bend the rules to help somebody who is in need of it. So this is the principles that are in there are the principles that drive me. And justice and fairness are huge principles that, uh, that drive me. And the life of the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of how he interacted with the different peoples and the different, at different times, um, whether they were unfair with him, whether they were nasty with him, whether they were good with him, in terms of how he interacted with them, to, to the idea of um, uh, whether it was in trade, whether it was in politics, whether it was in uh, social uh, 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 structures, social change that he was uh, bringing, all of these things matter. And 
that this is a driver for me. This is what makes me say, you know what? I want to do as much as I can to live up to the principles in the Quran. I want to be fair with people. I want people to be fair with me. I want to give people an opportunity. I want to give them a message. I, I want to be caring for them. I can't do everything. I'm, I'm but a human, but key is to try to do as much as I can to help others, again, irrespective of religion, irrespective of nationality, irrespective of political affiliation. At the end of the day, everyone is free to choose what he or she wants. The only thing you can choose is I can't choose who my parents were and what the color of my skin is. I can't do that. But everything else, I can choose. And as long as they are not harming others, and as long as they benefit others, and as long as they're caring of others, there's no reason why I would not want to take those principles that I've learned from the Quran and help apply it in my, sorry, sorry, apply it in my life and help others benefit from it. It's key and it's the most significant driver for me is to help others. There are people, and, and, and God bless them, but there are people who want to attain money for the sake of money. If they want to make their bankers happy, good for them. For me, the key is to take this money and utilize it for the benefit of humanity. And if I can't do that, then making money is useless. Michelle, yes, life is about choices and I really appreciate you choosing to spend the time to talk to us today and share your views. It has been a pleasure as always, so thank you.